On June 8, 1948, in a country still reeling from World War II, the German people were introduced to a mid-engined aluminium-bodied convertible, the 3561. It was to be the very first Porsche and would pave the way to become one of the world's most desirable sports car brands. On June 8, 2018, Porsche celebrates 70 years since that momentous occasion and we take a look at its history and talk to the people who live and breathe the Porsche badge. Porsche was named after the automotive designer Ferdinand Porsche at the turn of the 20th century and some of his designs have a lot of relevance today as motoring writer and Porsche enthusiast Michael Browning discusses. He built his first electric car in 1900, the Lona electric car which had electric motors and all four hubs and, and here we are uh, 120 years later about to have a, an electric driven Porsche on the market. He was involved in some of the design work on the uh, Alto Union racing cars and then he was asked by Adolf Hitler of course to prove what had already been a partial design on, on a people's car which became the Volkswagen. In 1939 he built a car which was the, really the forerunner of the first Porsche which was a record breaking car with a very aerodynamic body based on, on Volkswagen air cooled mechanicals so all the ingredients were right post war for the Porsche sports car. But it was Ferdinand's son Ferry who was the driving force behind Porsche. Independence has always been the attitude at Porsche to do not what is expected, but what we feel is right. In the beginning, I looked around and could not find quite the car I dreamed of, so I decided to build it myself. It happened the way a lot of these cars did after the war. They had a wealthy customer who wanted a car, a sports version, if you like, of a Volkswagen, and uh, it's, it's a very rare car, Porsche number 1356-01, because it was mid-engined. It was a two-seater with a mid-engine, rather like the Boxsters and Caymans are today, not a rear-engine car for which the, they've become famous. <laughs> And then came Porsche's first production car. 356s were these small engine cars. The first ones were only 1100cc and they were lightweight, tricky handling, but uh, aerodynamic little coupes and roadsters. And uh, in competition, they were class winners. They weren't outright winners, except in a few circumstances. So they were the ones that picked up the prizes for the efficiency or the most potent car under a certain engine size. They, that's where they got their fame. Alan Hamilton, who is father and himself imported Porsches for its first 40 years in Australia, discusses how his dad, Norman, found an interest in the brand and how Alan himself got involved. Dad was busy manufacturing pumps and then he heard about the Snowy Mountains scheme and decided he'd better take a trip over to Europe and find out how the Dutch were keeping the water on the right side of the dikes and whilst he was driving down there he got passed by this funny little sports car and eventually caught up with the chap who was driving it. Uh, went back to the Porsche factory and ordered the first two right-hand drive Porsche cars to be built. In fact he owned the tooling for the right-hand drive cars up until 1954. Uh, because Porsche was still a fledgling company in those days and didn't have a lot of money and couldn't afford to do basically what they were doing. Dad picked up the first two cars there, a Cabriolet and, and a Coupe, both of which still exist today. And the third car that arrived in Australia, that's also still alive and going well. Dad always told me that I'd be dependent on him for a job, so of course I didn't like that idea. And then my father said, well, I better come and work for him. So I joined the company in 63, 64. The business was pretty slow in those days. I finished up taking over the business in 1962 and uh, Dad said, all right, you can run it. And I said, well, that's not good enough. I need to own the shares as well and so I took over in 1972 only to get booted out by Porsche in 1992. But it wasn't just Porsche that Norman could have got the franchise for. Dad also came back with the franchise for Volkswagen but the federal government because we had very strict importing laws in those days you got an import license restricted to a certain amount of money and that certain amount of money managed to buy two and a half cars a year in, when it came to Porsches. In the end, the government gave them a choice, well, you can have Volkswagen or you can have Porsche. There are some unforgettable moments with the Porsche family that will always remain with Alan. Certainly my first visit to the factory when I was 23 years old and became friendly with both Peter and Wolfgang Porsche. We used to 
go into town together and once a month I'd have lunch with the Porsche family at their private home. I met all the big wigs of Porsche in those days, Professor Helmut Bott, who was the head of research and development at BISAC and uh, often stayed at his private home. It wasn't just cars that Porsche produced, though. Porsche did a whole lot of things. They built a lot of tractors, four different series of tractors with a single twin a three- and four-cylinder engines, which really ran through the 50s and into the 60s, and they're very collectible now. The former head of Porsche, um, Venlin Wiedeking, who infamously uh, tried to take over Volkswagen just as the, uh, the global financial crisis dawned and failed, he was a potato farmer. or well, he had a potato farm, and uh, he's got a, a Porsche tractor there. And they even made motorbike engines. You know, I saw the developments of engine that Porsche were building for Harley Davidson back in the early days, and and when they presented to Harley Davidson, it got rejected because uh, it was too well balanced and didn't have the nasty vibrations that. <laughs> As the 356 came to an end by the mid-60s, its successor became one of the most desired sports cars ever. Introducing the new Porsche 911, the only car that could beat the 911. The 911 wasn't welcomed by Porsche enthusiasts at the time. In fact, it was regarded with quite a bit of mistrust because it, it was a big departure from the 356. You see, the 911 was a totally different chapter. Porsche was sensing there was a, a market for a different car, but uh, Bootsy Porsche Ferry's son, he was in the design department, but uh, he was seconded onto the design team. He was said to have been the designer of the 911, which was a nice bit of PR spin, but he was one of a team. And in fact, he was really doing his father's bidding because a guy named Erwin Commender, the head of the design team, was designing it. And uh, Ferry Porsche didn't like the direction which he was going with this new larger 356 with a six cylinder engine. And he really secreted his son onto the team to try and steer Commander in the right direction, meaning his direction. But uh, when it was launched in 1965, uh, it was considerably more expensive than the 356. And so Porsche had to backtrack a little bit and they introduced the 912, which really had the mechanical components of the last four cylinder 356 and sold at a cheaper price. So it, it had a, a price leader while it changed over from 356 to 911. The 911 was a car that you got into and you felt that you owed something to the car. It repaid you in spades as well. If I wanted to go for a run up over the Black Spur and, and early one morning when the police weren't around, I couldn't imagine anything better than a 911. It was, you know, very satisfying to uh, think, hmm, I did that well, you know. <laughs> Australian racing legend Jim Richards is known for his multiple championship wins driving Fords and BMWs since the 70s, but more recently it's Porsches that Jim has found success. I've got two Porsches, a GT3 RS and a Cayman GT4 and I use them for ride days and for rallies from 1993 until now. I've been racing Porsches every year since then. Listen, I've had so many great victories in, in Porsches and great success in Porsches. Tiger Tasmania, which is a five-day rally around Tassie. We've won uh, eight times in Porsches, and um, mind you, we've been in it 26 times. But um, the Carrera Cup cars I drove initially and won the championship in, in, 1990, in 2003 was brilliant, but lots of different races have been just as entertaining and just as good. While Jim races modern Porsches, Alan Hamilton raced the classics when they were new. While I was working at the factory in 1968, no, no, it was 65, they were building in those days the 904. And I thought, oh, I wouldn't mind one of those, that'd be good fun. They offered me the Targa Florio car from uh, 1965. Uh, so I bought um, that car and it came out here and I won the Australian Hill Climb Championship in it, which coincidentally was the first national championship won by a Porsche in Australia. It was called the Ugly Duckling uh, at the factory and was also nicknamed the Kangaroo because it had an ability to jump off the road periodically. But it was probably one of the ugliest sports cars they ever built. In 1968, he ordered an orange 911 from the factory and raced it in the last single event for the Australian Touring Car Championship. But not all went swimmingly. Even though I crashed on the last lap, I managed to get back on the track and drive to the finish line because I'd blown a tyre out on the um, bottom of the Warwick Farm Strait. 
uh, and disappeared down into the trees and there was a lot of crashing noises but surprisingly very little damage. They were all rotten and fell over and I sort of made it back on the track and still finished third. Ron Goodman operates the official Porsche Collision Centre and he's known for racing classic Porsches while travelling the world, racing at many famous events and circuits. Here he recalls a moment where his 356 Cabriolet ended up in the wall. What happened at Indianapolis when we finally got onto the oval track, we were um, 18 seconds a lap faster than any other car out there. They led a open wheeler out there with us and he just decided to move up to the right hand side of the track to turn left when he was going 20 seconds a lap slower than the rest of the field. His right rear wheel collected with my left front wheel and it just sent me up, up, up and into the wall of Indianapolis. In 2016, Ron documented his year of Porsche racing in the Road to Monterey movie and won gold at Germany's Autovision Film Festival. His latest video was surely impressed too. We were out at the Macquarie Ice Rink the other night and we actually had a game of hockey against a hockey team, but I was in the 356. It was one of the best things that we've ever done. We're taking the car over to Megalese in Canada in February, and we're going to do the Porsche ice driving course. But before that, we're comparing my 54 Pre-A against the latest Porsche. Porsche enthusiast Lars Mueller is celebrating the Porsche 70th by filming Porsche Diaries Destination Australia. We'll be covering about 6,000 kilometres in the end from Sydney to Brisbane, Brisbane back down to Melbourne, taking the coast road and then to Melbourne, Adelaide and then back again and uh, we'll do that in a total of 24 days. And he's doing it in style. Taking the 1956 356, her name is Frau Brenner. Ron Goodman is putting a Rod Emery Super 90 engine in it. She's going to be able to move fast around that trip. The most powerful car Porsche has ever produced was this. The 917 30 Spider. Its V12 turbo engine producing 820 kilowatts of power, it was hard to beat. In 1976, Porsche went against its DNA of the rear or mid-mounted engine configuration and produced this. Porsche people, get ready. The 924 Turbo is here. Well, the 924 was, wasn't meant to be a Porsche. That's the that's proper reason why it looked a little bit like the odd child in the family. And it was uh, originally conceived as a, an Audi project. It was designed as a, a price leader in the United States. You know, it was never really meant to be a Porsche, but it served well in that market for Porsche initially. And then with a succession, really, of developments when it became the uh, later the 924 Turbo and then the 944 and 944. 4S2, 944 Turbo and 968 and it was seen as the direction which Porsche was heading. In fact uh, Peter Schutz I think who was the head of Porsche in the late uh, 70s had basically decreed that the Porsche 911 was dead. They just kept the 911 going for enthusiasts and it was thought that the 924 and then the new 928 and then succession of 944 four cylinders were the future of the company. It was nearly the death of Porsche particularly in the States because they made the mistake of uh, trying to be a bit like other people. And then, of course, when the recession of the late 80s came, Porsche were left with their front-engine cars and uh, a 911 which really hadn't had any development money of any significant spend on. So they were, they were caught with their pants down. If I wanted to drive to Brisbane or, or to Sydney, I couldn't imagine anything better than a 928. The 928 GT was exactly that. It was a grand touring car. If I got into a 928, I'd kind of wake up when I got home. It just sort of seemed to find its own way there. Just when we thought Porsche couldn't make a more insane car after the 930 Turbo, then came the 959. Well, the 959 was proof that Porsche could build a proper car, and uh, I've fortunately been able to drive one, and my first surprise was just how sporting 
what a firm car it was. I thought it might be a bit of a, you know, an autobahn cruiser. It was a supercar. It was Porsche's first supercar as such, if you forget about the turbos. And it really had uh, four-wheel drive, as say twin turbo, and all these things. It was a very advanced car. Two initially came to Australia. Lindsay Fox still has one. Peter Bartels, former head of Elders Axel and Meyer. They had very strong performance in the day, 400 horsepower. They were special. Alan witnessed Ferry Porsche test the 959 prototype. Dr Porsche, as he was then, went out and drove around the track at Vysak and he drove around for some considerable time, but relatively slowly. Didn't go out and, you know, <laughs> go bananas. And uh, he had a riding pad on his knee and he came in and he handed <laughs> Professor Bott all the notes that he'd made while he was driving around, even at reduced speed. And they were all things that they had to incorporate in the car before it went into production. He's a very astute man. Prices have spiked, not only for the million dollar 959, but for many Porsche models. It's to the point where they are now out of reach for many people, and this is why replicas are becoming the more affordable choice, as Lars Mueller discusses. The replica market is somewhat frowned upon or hush-hush. There are the replicas and then there are the real Porsches. They are a whole community amongst themselves, and one of the visits that we'll be making is, you know, to see some of the replicas and actually see a replica a builder in Queensland, if the replica scene also makes the Porsche dream more attainable, what's wrong with that? When the 964 was introduced in the early 90s as one of the highest maintenance production Porsches you could buy, the company hit hard times. At that time, Porsche was on its knees. They were hardly selling any cars. You know, the, the production dwindled right down. The German government wanted Daimler-Benz to take over Porsche, to keep it in Germany. Wendland Wiedeking, he was brought in. He really came in and virtually saved Porsche from being taken over. And he did something unthinkable at the time. He called in Toyota time in motion people, production experts from Japan. And the only reason he was able to do this is the German workforce, the, the unions agreed to it on the basis they knew the worst alternative was to be taken over by their arch rivals on the other side of Stuttgart, Mercedes-Benz. That was the only way they were prepared to tolerate it and Bedekin got it through. The new Porsche Boxster is assembled at Zuffenhausen, Germany. Much the same way our original roadsters, the spiders, were assembled by human hands. As the late 90s turned into the millennium, it brought great change within the brand, with many new models introduced. A boxer was a design study at the 1992 Paris Motor Show and went into production, but it was only meant to be a short-lived model. It was meant to be a, a bridging model to keep Porsche alive while well, it recovered its feet. But it had 42, I think 42%? commonality of parts with the 996 of the day so it was economical to build inside they were low rent quite plasticky not particularly inviting but they performed very well as the world grew more obsessed with suvs porsche had to move with the times the new macar life intensified the porsche cayenne precision utility and up to 570 horsepower of legendary Porsche performance. Well, the Cayenne came out, uh, arrived in Australia in 2003, and the reception was poor. Journalists panned it from the start. It was, was odd-looking. The Porsche brief on the car was it was to benchmark a Toyota Land Cruiser off-road and a BMW X5 on-road. And the reason they produced the, the Cayenne was they foresaw in the future that just the volume of Porsche sports cars was not going to be enough to keep the company alive and independent as major players in the industry. So they foresaw that there wasn't enough profit in the sports cars to keep the thing going. Then in 2009, a four-door sports sedan was unveiled. The courage to build a sports car with four business class seats. The courage to upgrade not only the driving, but also the driver. The courage to transfer an unmistakable design DNA and create a luxury saloon that was born on the racetrack and is at home on the roads. The new Panamera. Courage changes everything. Rasma Ertel works for Porsche Experience, giving fans the chance to drive on ice and track. I'm originally from Germany. I've been in Australia for about seven years, so that was never my plan. Uh, I was part of an internship and originally I had applied for an internship in America. And yeah, Porsche back then offered me an internship in Sydney. 
So it all started with yeah, my internship back in Germany at Weisser at the research centre. And that's how I yeah, came to Australia. And this is why she chose to pursue a career with Porsche. I was always inspired by the cars, the branding, the, the ads. And it's a unique company with strong ideals. We're all very proud to work for the brand. We're all enthusiastic and very Porsche. You know, he realised his um, dream of building the car that he um, had in his vision. And just to put that into reality. So he he was very um, dedicated and also passionate and just enthusiastic about cars. So you feel that when you're here in the company. So what direction should Porsche take for the future? This is what Michael Browning thinks. It aims to produce the Porsche of whatever market segment it goes in, which means it has to be a tactile car. It has to have a degree of driver engagement and driver feel and a totally autonomous vehicle that the driver can't relate to is not on the agenda. When they're going into this Mission E concept, it will handle, it will break, it will convey feelings to the driver like a Porsche sports car. There are thousands of Porsches on Australian roads appreciated by each and every owner, including members of the Porsche Club of Victoria. My name's Justin, I've got a 1968 911L and we look after my late father's 356 which he bought new in 1961. Dad was one of the founder members of the Porsche Club of New South Wales back in 1963. I'm Will Darvel, I am a foundation member of the club which started 42 and a half years ago. I have a 550 Spider replica which I built myself with help. Uh, it has a 911 motor and gearbox. I'm Vicky Sturzaker. Currently, we only have two Porsches. <laughs> oh, <laughs> only two Porsches. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? And today we're in Russ's 924 Carrera GT, which is one of 15 that were brought into Australia. And uh, it's an amazing little car, very rare. They homologated it for Le Mans back in 1981. It doesn't come out very often because it isn't that comfortable either. I'm Gary, um, I've got a uh, Cayman 981 GTS and I've just recently purchased another 981 Cayman S for the track. It's a lot faster than uh, my previous track car which is a old 944 S2 1989 model. And uh, I've got a Boxster at home, a nice red one, it's a typical red Roadster. We've had 10 Porsches between us now. Uh, hi, my name's Russell Sturziger, I'm a member of the Porsche Club, one of the original founding members of the club and we went to the very, very first club meeting in 1976. Went along with my father at the time and uh, purchased my first Porsche about three months after that meeting. He had one as well, so that's where I got my interest in the mark. Hello, my name's Barbara Darvel. I have always liked German engineering through my father who was an aeronautical engineer. He taught me about the beauty of simplicity in engineering. I'm Dennis. Uh, I currently have a uh, Carrera uh, C4S and a uh, Cayman uh, 987. Uh, I'm now on my 13th, 14th Porsche. My second Porsche was a 1958 356A, which is still uh, registered in the same registration and in the hands of a collector, and it's been in Melbourne all its life. We have a 2016 Cayman S, Barbara, my wife, and that's her daily driver. My first car was a uh, black, 1974 Target S. Then I bought a 2.7 RS, which I raced and hill climbed for a while until I broke that off, <laughs> and nearly myself. I got my first Porsche in 1968, which was a 912. You just slid into the driver's seat and everything was at your fingertips. It was so far ahead of anything else of the day. I'm not a big V8 fan, I'm more of a, an air-cooled flat six woman. <laughs> Having been with the club for uh, 33 years, uh, I first got into Porsches because uh, somebody said you could put a V8 Chevy in it, which is what I did. It becomes a way of life. So, what makes a Porsche a Porsche? Maybe it's the sounds. Or the connection. 
I can honestly say nothing that we repair or nothing that, that I drive comes close to Porsche. Of course, they're drop dead gorgeous. You basically know if you don't drive off the track or if you don't crash them or if you don't run into someone, the car's going to last a whole race without a hiccup. I think the first time I ever saw a 911, I think that was the moment I thought it's got to be Porsche. I could never find anything that had the same efficient simplicity that was designed for the driver. Uh, they're a car that's um, very undiscerning and understated. You know that you're in one when you're in there, you can't beat them. I think the beauty of anything attracts you initially and then uh, its qualities come through once you examine it. It is distinctly different to other vehicles and the more Porsches become like other vehicles to drive, the less enamoured I am with them. They're an unassuming car. The, the businessman can get in it, drive to work, he can take his family out in the afternoon and he can go onto the track and have just as good a time as somebody that's got a full-blown race car. People mistake Porsche as a car. Porsche is a sort of a feeling. It's not one thing, it's a combination of things that create a special feeling of driving and communicating with a motor vehicle. It's clear to see the Porsche love is still strong. Whether it's the badge, the driving experience or the rich history that attracts a person to Porsche, every owner will tell you there is no substitute. Here's to another 70 years of continuing to inspire the driver.